I'm sorry, folks. So there's a, a market, as you can imagine, there are a number of different uh, technologies and uh, levels of expertise, areas of expertise that are necessary to accomplish something like this. So uh, we have uh, uh, several, each one of these people is a, a, a PI or a co-PI, so they each have a lab of their own. So we have a, a, a very large influx of of help to do mathematical modeling of how the campus uh, changes input signals into output signals, how it forms a new long term memory under code. Uh, very happy to uh, have some of the this last year to uh, begin to work with Christy and with Charles, uh, working on some issues having to do with epilepsy and uh, with them, hoping to develop a uh, a patient population that will be able to use the device and the system that, we, that we're developing. Uh, eventually, whatever the system is, it has to be miniaturized so that it can be essentially worn by the patient uh, when the patient walks around. I don't know. I don't think so. And uh, so that's uh, John Bernacki and his group at, at ISI. And uh, Sam Detmarler, Rob Hansen, they're at Wake Forest. They conduct many of the behavioral experiments where we're testing uh, the system we're developing in rats and in non-human primates. And then Greg Gerhardt is at the University of Kentucky is someone who uh, designs and fabricates uh, new, uh, new episode uh, uh, multi-site electrode arrays so that we can record from the soft population that we need. Uh, obviously, this is very good thing. So I won't say too much about this except that they're really, the, the kind of prosthesis that we're working on is really a brand new class of prosthesis, a positive prosthesis. It's not like the sensory prosthesis. Uh, this is a Mark and Lyons um, uh, artificial retina, uh, replacement retina. So with the sensory prosthesis and, and cochlear implants, we're trying to uncover the, the uh, transduction process by which uh, physical energy is transformed into, uh, into electrical uh, activity that propagates through the brain. Uh, motor prosthesis, and I'm really happy to um, have known Richard Anderson and his group for many years. Uh, and he and other people like Jerry Loeb at USC are designing systems that, uh, that, that try to control uh, muscles to initiate uh, coordinated movement. And there's both of these, and both of those two classes uh, are either working at sensory and the motor end, but the areas that are in between, that is, the cognitive areas, are, are essentially. Uh, um, okay, thank you. Thanks very much. Um, so the areas that are in between the sensory uh, input and the motor output uh, are more or less intact. But what we're talking about is now. Uh, creating a prosthesis to replace uh, the cognitive function in areas that are in between. So that means uh, first, first uh, developing a mathematical model for how uh, whatever cognitive process we're working on, how that, uh, how that cognitive process uh, proceeds. So how does a given part of the brain, the, the language for which we don't know, how does it process inputs into outputs? And then once that biomimetic model is produced, can we, can we connect it up to the brain in the uh, anatomically appropriate way? We have the input signals that normally went to the damaged part of the brain, instead go to our microchip, our biomimetic model, and then can the output of the biomimetic model go to the areas of the brain that used to receive the output from the damaged region? So that this, uh, uh, this, little cartoon um, encapsulates, of course, an awful lot of work that needs to be done. But we're, and the, the, there's, there are, are a couple of key aspects to, to this approach, um, or this problem, that need to be addressed. And one of them, of course, that we, we're, what we want to do is to, uh, I mean, we want, we want to, um, uh, as I said, deal with 
deal with the output signals of one part of the brain. We want to process those and then put them back into the brain. So we have to be able to deal with the language that the brain uses. We have to be able to understand uh, uh, the signals that are generated by the brain sufficiently so that we can process them correctly and then put them back into the brain so the brain can actually use them. This is not uh, this is novel territory. And so what are the problems? And the, and the problems uh, uh, are, are, are based on the some of the foundations of neurons, which is that when they when they talk to each other, neurons represent information in the form of all or none action dependence. The place where we have to start when you're listening to the output of a neuron, what you are hearing are a series of these all or none events, a series of these action potentials. And because the amplitude is uh, the same, then the only aspect of the signal that can carry information is the time between action potentials. So we, we need to be able to understand not just does that event occur or not, but what is the temporal pattern that's being generated by this neuron and sent to another neuron. And in, in brains that are as large as the ones that you and I have, mammalian brains, a single neuron is not really that important. Uh, given the, the wine that we just drank before the meal, we probably killed a couple hundred thousand neurons. And yet, you, you will be able to find your way to your car, you will, you will remember your name, and uh, you won't be drooling. It's, uh, it'll be all right. So the, we can, one, one neuron by itself doesn't really contribute that much to a cognitive event. There are really populations of cells that, uh, that are coding, um, that are transmitting information. And so we have to think in terms of, of, of not just codes, uh, temporal codes for one neuron, but space, space time codes, spatial temporal codes. So this is what's representing information. Well, how is, how is, if this is the beginning of a memory, for example, how is it changed into a, a long-term memory? What does change, what does process mean at the level of neuron? And what process means is that the incoming temporal code is changed by one neuron into a different outgoing temporal code. Or when we're thinking about populations, then the incoming spatial temporal code is changed into a different outgoing spatial temporal code. That's what process means at the level of neuron. If, we, if we're going to understand this at the level of making observations or applying uh, uh, rules and applying uh, models, we have to think in terms of spatial temporal code and the transformation of the spatial temporal code. That's what we have to do. And so that really has to uh, govern all of the approaches that we, that we take overall. Uh, so we want to uh, uh, develop this. Uh, cognitive prosthesis, but it's in the campus. Again, this is the part of the brain that, that changes short-term memories into long-term memories. So the, the, the inputs to uh, the hippocampal formation uh, are the equivalent of short-term memory, and they're, they're re-encoded in ways that we're trying to understand. Uh, and what comes out the other end is the long-term, is the code for a long-term memory. And as I mentioned, there are a number of different ways in which the hippocampus can be damaged, and this uh, formation of new long-term memories can be blocked. Uh, and what we want to do is to understand enough about the function of the hippocampus that we can develop a mathematical model, instantiate that model into a microchip that can be worn on the top of the skull, and then through multi-site electrode arrays, uh, record activity that is upstream from the damage, but activity that's still normal, transmit that activity up to our device that can perform the process that the part of the hippocampus used to perform, that the damaged area used to perform, and then transmit this the process information, the new long-term memory, uh, down to the output of the hippocampus and force the output of the hippocampus to be whatever is appropriate given the input. All right, so instead of having this uh, process take place here in neural terms, we're going to do it yeah, in silicon. And the, and the goal is to, uh, well, that's, that's essentially our goal. And uh, I'll show you how close we've come to that so far. This is a, a cross-section through the hippocampus that 
Uh, you don't need to know too much about all of this, except that it's a relatively straightforward circuit. Um, and if this circuit is broken at any point, then the ability to form new long-term memories is gone. Uh, the hippocampus does not store long-term memories. It converts short-term memories into long-term memories. And then it transmits those new, uh, those new codes to other parts of the brain for storage. So if, if there's damage to the hippocampus, the, the uh, long-term memories that were already created, those are still fine. They're not lost. It's the ability to uh, uh, learn someone's name, for example, after the damage that's disrupted. The hippocampus is responsible for what's called declarative memory, a fact-based memory. And for episodic memories, or the order, the temporal order of memories. So it's it's it's, uh, it's really there for creating new uh, long-term memories, or what's often called uh, working memories. Uh, so what? So how did we go about this? Um, uh, we we needed a task that animals could perform that we, where we could examine hippocampal function. I'm not sure how this is. So that animation is gone, unless somebody can figure out how to do it. It's a discord video. Okay. 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 So we have, oh, no, no. Can I forget one thing that the second one is? So there's a sample, a sample, and that's the, what the animal has to remember. Then he goes to another part of the cage and he pokes his nose uh, in this uh, part, of it, and there's a light that comes on. And if he, as long as he pokes his nose in here, the next phase of the task doesn't, does not continue. As long as, he, as soon as he, as soon as he, uh, there's a, there's a, uh, there's a random delay period. As soon as that's complete, two levers come out of this wall and the animal has to pick the opposite of the one that you chose before. So it's a, this, this task needs to have a, a delay period. It needs to have a, a, a period that's a memory period. Um, and for reasons we won't go into, it's, it's better for rats to have it be a, a non-master sample than instead of a master sample. So here, this one was presented before. He pressed the right one, so he got to the board. And, uh, and that's, so that's what the animal has to do. And, uh, <clears throat> sorry for all this uh, distraction. Uh, so, uh, as the delay, this is a, a, a what's called a forgetting curve. Right? So as the delay gets longer and longer, the animal remembers uh, to a lesser and lesser extent until finally he could reach chance levels down here. So the animal's long-term memory lasts for about uh, 60 seconds, 45 to 60 seconds. Beyond that, uh, it's, he performs randomly. And these animals are implanted with electrodes uh, up and down the length of the hippocampus. And so that they're, they're implanted in a way that allows us to examine the propagation of activity through the hippocampus. Remember I showed you this uh, circuit before? So we're going to look at this region and this region, and we'll be able to see the differences between the codes here and here. And, and the goal, that we're, the goal, our goal is to see if we can mathematically model how memories are converted from this, you know, almost 
long-term memory to a long-term memory. See if we can understand that that coding and be able to make a prediction as to how that, as to what that code, what that code is. And when we look at the cells in the hippocampus, so we're recording from these all or none action potentials uh, over over time. And it turns out that the cells partition uh, what they code into multiple uh, classes. So some cells respond only to where things are. So they may respond to the left, regardless of whether it's the sample phase or the non-match phase where they're supposed to report. They don't care about anything else except did it occur on the left. Some cells respond only to a certain phase. If it's the sample phase, they'll respond regardless of whether it's left or right. If it's the non-match phase, they'll respond regardless of whether it's left or right. And then some cells are combinations of these and other cells that are really showing you the solution to the task. And here, the sample was on the right, and what the animal needs to do is to remember this and then respond to the, the other uh, location, the left, at the non match phase. So the different classes of information to perform this task are partitioned into different cells. Right? And all of this is, all of this is circulating So what's our model of this one of our of this code? So we're looking at at a lot of these all or none events recorded in this part of the hippocampus CA3, and we're looking at a lot of these events that are different because they didn't transform that are in CA1. So this is a completed long-term memory. This is an almost completed long-term memory. And what we need to do is to understand how we you know what this is coding and how is it transformed into this. Because if we have to replace, for example, this part of the circuit, this is what we have to do. Let's imagine that this part of the circuit was damaged for some reason, and in fact it's preferentially damaged during the stroke, during the periods of anoxia. What we would have to do to correct this is to go in and replace how these space-time patterns are transformed into these space-time patterns. If we don't do that, we're not being instructed in that. So, uh, I'm not going to detail too much about this, but uh, simply tell you that we've developed new methods that allow us to uh, uh, account for um, the, these temporal codes and to, uh, uh, well, I'll just leave it at that, account for these temporal codes. Uh, this is, you need to remember this equation if you want to get out of the <laughs> you want to get out of the, par the parking lot. What's important about this equation, though, is that this is this is actually this is part of the model. And what's really interesting about this is that um, different different parts of codes timings right, are captured by different parts of this model. So this first this what's called a, a K1 or a first order kernel captures uh, what the effect. This is the output. It captures what the effect is of, of a single input event, a single action potential, regardless of when the action potential occurs. So if it's here, it codes that or stores it. If it's here, it codes that. So it, it captures the, the effect on the output of any single action potential. So if you want to know what single events do, this is the term that you go to. And so this line will go through. But it's very, it's very simple. If you of T is your output, X of T is the input, and that you, you observe. You're looking at multiple times in the past, just like I showed you here. So, but then this K1 is what you're estimating, which is the influence of the input on the output of all of those. The second, this second order term captures not what the effect of the single event is, but what the effect of pairs are. Right? If you want to understand how uh, a series of spikes is transformed into a different series of spikes. You have to know exactly this kind of information. How did one spike become a spike or a not spike over here? How did a pair of spikes become a, a pair of a pair over here or a single over here? You have to look at singles and pairs and triplets and quadruplets 
And, and that's how you understand the coding process, if you can develop a model that will do this. So pairs, regardless of the time between them, and regardless of where they are, et cetera. This is the cross term. You can have inputs that converge onto the same neuron. So there'll be cross terms. So we need to know what the influence is of this time interval on that output, regardless of what the interval is, and the reverse. And then finally, there's a triplet term. And so we're attaching the effects of triplets, effects of quadruplets, etc. So that's how we understand how any arbitrary pattern of pulses becomes a different pattern of pulses. And it's what converts it is the biology. It's just a matter of what the synapses are and what the uh, biophysical properties of the neurons are, et cetera, et cetera. Right. So this is what we develop. I won't go through the rest of it. And uh, of course, all of you are extremely familiar with maximum likelihood estimation, so I don't have to go through it, right? And if you can say Moldrop Smirnoff, then you get another glass of wine. So we put all these models together, and this is what we come up with. So this is just one example. We typically look at 20 to 30 neurons at a time on the input, 20 to 30 neurons in the output. And so that's a very large space-time pattern. And we figure out how the system, the synapses and the neurons, convert that to a different output pattern. So this is an example of what, this is just eight neurons. Uh, blue, dark blue means almost no activity. Red, bright red means lots of activity, and then things are in between. So this is what this what this is what evolved over time, recording from these eight neurons. And if our model is a good model, then we will be able to, with looking at the same input over here, we'll be able to predict the pattern which is here. And this is how well we do, which is really good. I won't go through it, but it's very hard. Out of the problem. And even harder to implement in real world terms. And it works very nicely. So, for these complex sets of codes, we can predict very accurately how this system is going to transform those codes into the, uh, an output uh, long term memory code. And if we look at, uh, if we use the model and ask it to predict, you know, when, when there's a, an event on the left. What does that code look like? This is what it looks like. But is it different than when there's an event on the right? Yes, it's very different than this. Well, that's good. That means that we're understanding this coding process well enough that we can see and identify separate codes for separate things. So everything in the world should have its own people. The only reason that we can distinguish it is because it has a code, a neural code, that's different from other neural codes. So we're beginning to understand this, the language of the brain, so to speak, and how it creates these codes for different events. And we have a lot of things to do in the, in the future to uh, understand this code in better terms, but uh, nonetheless, uh, we can see it and understand it. Um, I'll let this one go. Um, and I think I'll, I'll let this go too, except that, uh, you know, with, the, with this with this event, with this uh, task that we just looked at, there are 